Hello, I'm Mark Payne. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the West Virginia Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of civic groups. Their presentation fee is paid by the council, and we ask only that their travel costs be covered by the host group. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Booker T. Washington or Ann Bailey come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures and make them more real. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question-answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. The 15 presenters on our History Alive roster have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Alive presentation is not a play. It is very much an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Live presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give you a sample of how a History Live presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Live character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio the Confederate spy, Belle Boyd. Why, good day. My name is Belle Boyd, and it, what a pleasure it is to be here in the Canal Valley again. I did speak over at the Democratic State Convention there in Huntington back in 88, and I'm headed up to Grafton to speak at the Opera House later this week. My real name is Maria Isabella Boyd, and I was born over in the Shenandoah Valley on May 9, 1844, to Benjamin and Mary Boyd. I was the eldest of their eight children, and I can remember living there near Martinsburg. We lived in a beautiful little two-story house that was covered with honeysuckle and roses. And being the eldest of eight children, I was pretty much given free reign. But my parents were very strict about not letting children go to the dinner parties and the like. I can remember, though, at the age of 12, my mother and father were very displeased with me when the school mom followed me home from school one day. And I had fallen behind her was our slave Henry carrying my desk and I had been expelled. It was then that my parents decided to send me over to Baltimore to the very fancy finishing school of Mount Washington Female Seminary. There I learned to speak French, to dance, do fancy needlepoint and music among other things. I can remember on a dare even carving my name in initials in the window there in the drawing room in 1856. After four years of finishing school, it was time for my coming out ball and I debuted there in Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1860. Waltzing my way into the Capitol's high society with high hopes and countless joys. There were dinner parties, afternoon teas, and dances in the evenings. But political talk had crept into almost every corner of society. People were choosing up sides. There were the abolitionists in the North and, of course, the slaveholders of the South. In the election of 1860, they elected President Abraham Lincoln and he didn't take office until March of 1861. And it wasn't but just a few short weeks later that seven states succeeded from the Union, and Fort Sumter down in South Carolina was fired upon. 
where President Lincoln put out a call for 75,000 volunteers to put down the insurrection. And uh, it, it was supposed to only take two or three months to do this. Immediately, four other states succeeded, Virginia, of course, being one of them, called ourselves the Confederate States of America, electing Jefferson Davis as our president and asking General Robert E. Lee to head up the, the Confederate Army. Thousands of people were recruited. Everyone was wanting control of the uh, northern part of Virginia because that's where all the railroads were. And uh, my father, of course, joined up there with the uh, 2nd Virginia Infantry there at Harper's Ferry under General Thomas Jackson. It was almost a festive atmosphere. The women, folk, my mother and myself included, of the rebel cause there in Martinsburg, we joined together sewing flags with the motto, Our God, Our Country, and Our Women Folk on it. There were dances and picnics over at Harper's Ferry that my girlfriends and myself attended. No one knew what the next four years were going to bring the hardship to the country. It was in uh, July of 61 when the Union forces came and pushed General Jackson and his army further south, taking over our little village of Martinsburg there. In fact, during the war, Martinsburg was to change hands over 30 times, being captured by the north one day and retook by the south the next. All of the little border towns along uh, the northern part of Virginia there, like Strasburg, Winchester, Front Royal, Romney, and Martinsburg, faced similar circumstances. In July 61 there, right after the Battle of Philippi, the Union forces had come in there, and of course they were going to celebrate the 4th of July, drunken revelry with all the soldiers and the like. They had heard that we kept a rebel flag at um, the Boyd home there. I can remember the drunken soldiers literally bursting in the front door, breaking our china, knocking over the furniture. My mother standing there quite defiantly with her hands on her hips saying, Men, every person in my household will surely die before you hoist a Union flag over the Boyd home. My slave Eliza had very quickly run upstairs and took the Confederate flag off my bedroom wall and burned it. When one of the soldiers literally lunged into my mother, my blood just boiled and I pulled the revolver that my father had left with me and I pointed it at that Yankee and I shot and he fell to the floor. I was just barely 17 at the time. Of course, the Union soldiers came and dragged me down to the headquarters. The Yankee soldier had died, and I was in a great deal of trouble. I turned on the charm and the tears, saying that I had just acted uh, trying to protect my mother and myself from that drunken soldier. And the provost marshal ruled that I had acted in self-defense and, and let me go home. Of course, they had to post guards at our house because the Yankees were threatening to burn it down for me killing the soldier. I had no consciousness of being a spy at that time, but that event was to change my entire life. The soldiers, they sent the officers there to, on our porch to guard. I, I started talking to them and flirting with them, and they started telling me all kinds of military plans that the Yankee army had there. You know how men like to boast and brag about their exploits. Well, I thought to myself at the time that General Jackson and Beauregard would have need of this information, so I started writing down little notes and sending them with my slave Eliza. Of course, it wasn't very long until one of those little notes fell into a Union colonel's hands and I was called into his office and given a very stern warning and rebuke that aiding and comforting and giving information to an enemy during the time of war, I could literally be executed. But I was given a fatherly warning and sent home, and I continued my exploits there. Now, Colonel Turner Ashby, you know, he was the head of the scouts there in the Shenandoah Valley, and he had... Um, 
uh, found out about what I was doing. He pretended he was a veterinarian for the Union Army and working on their horses and the like and uh, did his spine that way. And he taught me how to write in secret cipher code and how to hide messages in watches, in my hair bun, and in the soles of your shoes or in a loaf of bread. So I become much more adept at the art of spying. My luck ran out, though, in March of 1862. I was there at Winchester at the train station. I was arrested and taken to Baltimore. I was put in a hotel there for a week. And again, another fatherly gentleman gave me a very stern talking to. My femininity was to benefit me a great deal during that time because most people, the art of chivalry was alive and well on the northern and the southern side, and most people thought, how could a mere slip of a girl be much danger to the Union Army? So again, I was a let go. Now, my parents were getting very concerned about my activities, and so they sent me down to Front Royal to stay with my mother's sister, Aunt Rebecca, Uncle John, and grandmother. They owned the Fishback Hotel there in uh, Front Royal. And um, anyway, the Union forces took over Front Royal, and they evicted us and used all the hotel there for their military headquarters, putting us out into the little college cottage in the courtyard behind the hotel. Well, it wasn't very long till I was charming all the Union officers there again in, in Front Royal, finding out information, and one night I learned there was to be a wall cancel, and right there in the dining room of the hotel, well, I knew that the closet right above the dining room table uh, had a small hole in it, so I hid up there during the daytime in the afternoon, and uh, peered down through that little bitty hole, stayed there, and listened to all of their military plans, memorizing as much of it as I possibly could. That night when the meeting broke up about 1 a.m., I went back to my room, wrote down and code all of the information I had learned, saddled my horse Fleeter out in the barn, and I rode down to the Confederate Army, which was about 15 miles south of Front Royal at that time. Left my message there for, for uh, General Jackson, and I was back in my bed when the sun came up the next morning. It was in May of 60, 1863 when I saw all the soldiers scurrying around there in Front Royal and I knew that something important was about to happen and so I asked one of them and they said that uh, General Jackson was less than a mile from Front Royal and marching this way and they were going to take all of the army and they were going to burn the bridges and head to Winchester with the ammunition. I knew that General Jackson needed this information as quickly as possible. I ran upstairs and with my binoculars looked out the, the window and I saw him on the cemetery hill overlooking the town. Grabbed my white bonnet, scurried down the steps and I ran right between the picket lines. The volley of fire, was bullet holes were going through my petticoat. There was a Cannon went off nearby me there, and I fell and hit the dust. I kept running as fast as I could. Major Harry Douglas was sent out from General Jackson there to find out what was going on, and I told him that he must quickly go into Front Royal, that the army was very small and they were going to burn the bridges, at which time he, General Jackson took his army, marched right through Front Royal there, saved the day, and he headed on toward the capital. Well, of course, it came out in all the newspapers the next week about my activities, and I denied all of them. And uh, they were calling me La Belle Rebelle, and the Union Army set a trap for me. They got one of the, the Union soldiers to pretend like he was a Confederate, and C.W. Smithy was his name. He was so handsome. He literally swept me off my feet, he did. And he... Uh, convinced me that he was a man after my own beliefs in the true southern way and the cause and and when he told me that he was to be sent south I asked him if he would take a message to General Jackson of course he agreed but he didn't take the message to General Jackson instead he went straight to Secretary of War Stanton and I was rested they finally had their ironclad proof and I was put into the old capital prison I didn't spend too long there. I was exchanged in a prisoner release, and of course my parents sent me down south to visit our kinfolk. It wasn't long though before I made my way back to Martinsburg and was arrested again and put into the old Carroll prison. I didn't fare as well there, I'm afraid, and I uh, uh, found myself uh, 
had come down with a typhoid fever like so many of the prisoners there did. My father lobbied for my release and I was sent again down south trying to regain my strength. The war was not going very well at the time after Gettysburg and Antietam and the death of General Stonewall Jackson. I decided I needed to go to Europe for a rest. When President uh, Davis found out I was going to Europe, he asked if I would take a desperate last minute dispatch over to England asking for help. I can remember leaving there on the Greyhound, a big tall sailing ship loaded with cotton there at Wilmington, North Carolina. We had to slip out in the dead of night to get past the Union flagships, but a heavy fog was there that night and when dawn finally broke, there was the USS Connecticut firing upon us. We gave run, but they were about to overtake us. They were throwing cotton bales over the side, so I burned my dispatches and threw my Confederate money overboard. But we were overtaken. Lieutenant Harding arrested me there, and it was his job to go all the way to Boston with the ship, the captain and myself. And on the way there, of course, we dined at his table every night. One of the most handsomest Yankee soldiers I had ever met very highly educated, took a great fancy to me and I to him. And by the time we arrived in Boston, he'd asked me to marry him. And uh, he'd let Captain Harry escape. Now I got to Boston, they didn't put me in a prison that time. They evicted me from the country. I went to England. Lieutenant Harding followed me over there, asked me to marry him. And we were married at St. James Church there in Piccadilly in August of 64. My father died. Uh, shortly after that, and I would have went back to the United States, but my mother to help my mother. But I was expecting near term with our first little girl there, and so Samuel went back, and he of course was promptly arrested, being the husband of the famous Belle Boyd, and put in prison. I was desperate for money there in England, and my uh, decided to write my memoirs down in a book, and I did send off a a telegram to President Lincoln and said that he should release my husband if he did not want certain embarrassing facts to come out in my book that would embarrass the United States government. So he let my husband out of prison. Samuel's health was very desperate at the time though. He never recovered and shortly thereafter died. After President Lincoln died after the war, President Johnson um, granted um, immunity to all of the Confederate trying to reunite the country. So I came back to America. I travel around now the countryside telling my stories of, about my exploits during the war. We must reunite this country. And so I always end my presentations with a plea to boy, both the boys of the blue and the gray that we now live under one flag, one country, one God forever. We're here with Miss Belle Boyd, and I want to thank you, Miss Boyd, for taking time to be with us today. Uh, and uh, Miss Boyd has agreed to answer uh, a few questions, and so I would like to ask first. I noticed you have a—is that a, a special pin or a medallion? The Southern or a Cross of Honor, sir. It was bestowed upon me by the Daughters of the Confederacy for my service during the war. Oh, well, that's uh, quite an honor then. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to ask you, I know that you, you were speaking a second ago and uh, some of your work uh, during the Civil War was in support of uh, General Thomas Jackson, Stonewall Jackson. What uh, were your impressions of General Jackson? He's the true apostle of freedom. Sir, I was made an honorary aide de camp to the general that night after the Battle of Front Royal. He sent a sentry back over there to the hotel where I stayed and he gave me what I consider my most prized position today. It was a handwritten note and it said, hastily, I'm your friend and I'd like to thank you for your immense service to myself and our country today. T.J. Jackson, Confederate States of America. Well, that has to be one of your most prized oh, possessions. It then. most definitely indeed is so. Huh. Uh, you grew up in uh, on or around Martinsburg. Uh, what did your what was what was it that your father did uh, when you were a child? And My father was a shopkeeper and owned a tobacco farm right outside of town. There. 
He kept a shop in Martinsburg. Mm -hmm. Queen Street, yes. Sir. Ah. Um, during the war, um, how did you travel around uh, or get from one place to the next during the war? The it was very difficult to travel the slightest distance without a pass. I had several phony passes that I would get through the picket lines with. I can remember there, uh, uh, they, the Union Army set up a picket right between our dairy and the farmyard there in Martinsburg. And, uh, they would stop the dare maid every day when she tried to do the milk, and so I wrote out a pass and got it duly signed, saying that these cows have permission of the United States government to go from the barnyard to the dairy twice a day for the purposes of milk and until further orders. And I had it signed, and I pasted it right between the horns of the cow. <laughs> I was very gratified to find that it had the desired effect. <laughs> Well, uh, as a result of, of uh, some of your efforts during the war, I know you spent time, as you said, uh, you spent some time in prison uh, during the war. And how were you treated? What was it like being in prison? I was actually in prison twice during the war, arrested six times and questioned over 30 times. The old Capitol prison there in Washington, D.C. is where I was sent first. They, Secretary of War Stanton wanted me to take swear an oath of allegiance to the government, which I refused to do. So I was ordered to stay in my room, but they left the door open so the other prisoners would roll messages to me on a marble with a rubber band, and we would roll messages back and forth. Someone smuggled me in a Confederate flag, which I would dangle from the window there. Looking out over Pennsylvania Avenue at all of the homes were just a short time before I had been the belle of the ball. But it was in, I was in the, actually in the old Capitol room there where Senators Clay, Henry, and Webster had once wrote mm -hmm. the laws that govern our country today. So d do you feel that you were well treated uh, by your Oh, most by the definitely. Prison the guards superintendent would there was very, very good to me. I used to entertain the other inmates by singing songs of the South. Maryland, oh my Maryland, sang to the tune of Old Christmas Tree, uh, you know, of course, is the Southern uh, anthem. Hmm. Well, at this time, I would like to introduce to you uh, uh, the presenter of Miss Bell Boyd, which is Patty Cooper. Uh, Patty Cooper is from Parkersburg and is a, 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 a member of our History Alive roster. And uh, I want to welcome you, Patty, to the program today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and um, I want to ask you, uh, Patty, uh, how did you go about doing your research for Belle Boyd? Well, she wrote um, a book called Belle Boyd in Camp and Prison, which is a very thick book. It was published in 1865 in England, was a bestseller in England and in America after the war. It tells a lot about her exploits in her own words. Of course, I first became interested in Belle when I was over in Martinsburg at the Belle Boyd house, which mm -hmm. you can tour today. It's run by uh, the Historical Society there. Uh, also down in Front Royal, um, the Belle Boyd Cottage um, has been moved and made into an, a historic site there. Um, a lot of Bell's artifacts are right next door in the Warren Rifles Confederate Museum mm -hmm. there in Front Royal. And I also traveled to Baltimore and the Mount Female Washington Seminary is still intact there. It has been totally remodeled and refurbished and it's owned by John Hopkins University. Uh, you had yeah. mentioned earlier about some newspaper. Did you research new, old newspaper? The newspapers Stories at the time during uh, during the Civil War, uh, Bell was notorious all over America. They called her the Sekesh of the South, the Cleopatra of the Confederacy, La Belle Rebelle, but uh, they were always printing up articles, a lot of things that there's no way she could have possibly done all the things right. that were attributed to her. Yeah, I, I find it amazing that she was so young and involved in so many things uh, that she, you know, mm -hmm. that were thrust upon her, really, I guess. She had just barely turned 17 when um, the war started. In fact, she um, uh, had turned 17 in May and shot the Yankee on July 4th of 1861 there. She was imprisoned twice and exiled and married before the age of 20. 
<laughs> so yeah, that's, that's an awful lot. Very remarkable life she led. Very clear thinking for a woman of, of that time period and, and under the, the stressful circumstances. A lot of stuff going on mm -hmm. around her. Uh, you had mentioned uh, also in, your, in the monologue about her uh, slave uh, Eliza. What sort of role did Eliza play? Eliza uh, was almost like a sister to her. They were very good friends. She actually transported a lot of the messages um, to the Confederates with her. Um, after um, she was freed after the war, they still remained in touch with each other. Uh, Belle sent baby gifts when her children, grandchildren were born in flowers when Eliza died. Hmm. Oh, so uh, what can you tell us about the, the after the war mm -hmm. years, I know that uh, Belle traveled around a good bit and... Uh... Well, she had actually become an actress in the theater over in England. And when she came back to America in 1868, uh, she found there was a lot of interest still in the war if from the up north as well as south. So she traveled around to the little towns and little vaudevillian theaters. She had uh, a, a, her troop was called uh, Dashing Deeds or Perils of a Spy, and she would tell about her exploits during the war. She was actually, re her husband died um, before she came back to America, and she was remarried, remarried twice after that and had four more children, one of which she named after all of her heroes. He was a baby boy and he died uh, right after birth, Arthur Lee Davis Jackson Hammond. And she had another daughter uh, that she named Marie Isabella and Bird and John. And uh, she uh, actually passed away in 1900 at the age of 57 up in Kilbourn, Wisconsin. She's buried there today because of the mortuary practices of the time. She was carried to her grave by four Civil War veterans and they brought dirt and soil from Virginia. And so she's buried under Virginia soil today. Uh, um. Well, she, uh, so when she traveled around, she actually was doing vignettes of, of sort of plays mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. of, of actual events in her life. Is that right, she would tell about all of her adventures during the war. But at the end, she would always try, she knew that it was important to reunite the country. And uh, that's why she always made an impassioned plea that the war was over now, we must move forward. We have one God, one flag, one people mm -hmm. forever. You know, did she maintain, a, where did she maintain her residence, or did she in the latter part of her, she, she was She lived for a time around. out in Texas, hmm. but she mostly the life of, a, of the theater troupe was on she the was road. She was on the road, <laughs> okay, well, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, I understand that. Uh, and finally, in about the last minute here, just, why Belle Boyd? What was it about Belle and or her story that, that made you want to uh, do a portrayal of her for our History Live program? Well, first of all, she's a true West Virginia heroine, being uh, born over there in Martinsburg. And there's so much interest in the Civil War today. And almost every, everyone has some sort of an interest in the Civil War. So. Mm. Well, uh, Patty, again, I want to thank uh, you for taking time out thank of your you schedule me. here because I know that uh, Patty Cooper does uh, several different characters. What are just a couple of the other characters very well, quickly? Well, I portray here? Matt Ann Bailey for the Humanities right. Council. I mm -hmm. tell the story of Betsy Ross, Eleanor mm -hmm. Roosevelt, Anna Jarvis, Susan B. Anthony, Fanny Crosby, and uh, I have my Irish Country Christmas program. Goodness, do you ever get confused and uh, <laughs> launch into one character when you should be in another? <laughs> uh, uh, well, some, when I answer the telephone, sometimes I don't know what time period I'm in or well, that, where I'm at. I, I have that same problem sometimes myself, but <laughs> at any rate. Thank you for having me. Thank you again for being here. And uh, I'm Mark Payne. Thank you for tuning in to History Alive. <laughs>